Good afternoon, everybody. We're about to start here, and I thank you for joining us. I am Maria Rodriguez Alcala. I work for University of Missouri Extension here in the Southwest uh, region of the state. And today our panel is um, titled the second uh, panel on innovative ideas during COVID-19. Uh, four farmers markets are gonna be sharing their stories. And as, as they start, I'm gonna be introducing them and then they'll be doing a little bit of the introduction as well. Um, so I have three co-hosts who have been helping me um, uh, with the preparation of this um, uh, uh, panel today. Uh, Bill McKelvey, Sarah Holting Massengale, Pam Dusman, and Jeff Samborski, actually four of them. And then we also prepared a handout for today, which is um, basically uh, an update of what we did for the first panel. So we added more stuff and it ended up being another handout rather than it, um, just updating the other one because we had too much stuff. And all of that is basically uh, resources that farmers markets, their vendors, their staff, their volunteers, um, their clients can use to find resources that can help them during this pandemic. Um, basically, those are things that we've been getting and it's just a way to put them all in one, uh, in one place. So it's a compilation of all of those resources that we have seen in the past month or so. Um, I also want to thank the panelists for joining their time today. And, um, and we are recording. There will be a link for this later. I will probably send that tomorrow. Uh, and that will be going out with also the handout in the same email. Um, and then there's also an article that MU Extension has put together for these panels. And so we are posting the videos and the, and the handouts in that um, link as well, which you also will, will be getting. Um, please share your questions in the chat. And if you can avoid just, um, if you have comments, we prefer that you email me those comments because we just can't probably attend to all the details if there's too much going on in the chat. So we prefer that we focus on the questions there. Once the panelists are done, we're gonna go into the uh, Q&A session. Um, and please stay muted and turn your camera off unless you are asking a question. Um, and then let me see what else we have. And I guess that's it for the announcements. Uh, each panelist will have 15 minutes to present. If you are getting close to your 15 minutes, I'll probably cut you like one minute before you're done. Uh, so just so you are aware of your time, since we have four panelists today, and then we wanna make sure that we have time for Q&A. Um, so our first panelist is Andrew McGowan, and he is from the Nixa Farmers Market in Southwest Missouri, uh, south of Springfield. And, um, so I'm gonna let um, Andrew start and I'm gonna get out of here. Are you ready, Andrew? I sure am. Okay, well, uh, if everybody can hear me good, then uh, I have a little presentation that uh, I will just share real quick. Okay, so my name is Andrew McGowan and I'm the president of the Nixa Area Farmers Market. And so I, uh, we're a small-ish market, a small to medium-sized market uh, located in Nixa, which is just south of Springfield. And uh, at the peak of our season, we'll have 15 to 20 vendors and that's usually uh, early summer. And then we have a few um, festivals around town that. Uh, we'll see a, a bigger customer base, but usually we'll see, oh, in the summer, around 300 people come through the market. We're open eight to noon on Saturdays, and we set up in a parking lot in the middle of town. Our market began um, in 1990, just with some farmers getting together and selling their produce uh, in the church parking lot, but then actually incorporated it as a not-for-profit in 2000. And so we've been in the same spot uh, there for 30 years. And... Um, just trying to provide good stuff. We're completely run by volunteers. None of us have a salary or anything like that. And uh, we are a grower producer only market. And uh, that means that you have to grow it or make it or build it or whatever to sell at the market. And we're a local only market as well. So in uh, that just for us means Christian County or any county that touches it. 
As far as vendors, I would say probably 70 to 75% of our vendors are produce vendors. And then we do have that 25 to 30% that are craft vendors. And a lot of them, uh, they double dip, they do both. So they um, may have some craft or soap or something like that that they make, but they also sell produce when it comes in. Our typical operations, uh, usually in, in March or April, we have a spring vendor meeting where we get as many vendors together to go over the rules and, and pay fees and all of that kind of stuff to set up for um, the season and just explain and answer questions and all of that. And uh, as I said, we're in a parking lot. So we just set up, uh, it's a rather large parking lot, but we take one corner of it. It doesn't really have a defined entrance or exit. And usually our market has quite a bit of community interaction. Some of our customers have been coming there for 10 years or 15 years, and they like to sit down and talk with the vendors. They have friends that are vendors. A lot of us have made friends there at the market. And so there's a lot of community interaction. And usually we are, are pretty focused on doing lighthearted, fun, um, funny, hopefully, uh, Facebook communication. And I like to make memes, which is a personal flaw, I know. But so I like to post stuff like this on our Facebook page uh, just from time to time to throw that up there to bring people's attention to the market and uh, whatnot, just to see uh, some of the funny, I hope, things that we put out there. Uh, of course, the one here on the left, uh, Van Gogh, you know, cut off his own ear so his mask won't stay up. But we do have a vendor that she sews masks, and that's been a, a great service for the community as well. So when the pandemic came around and we started thinking about what's the year going to look like, uh, the way that we approached it was, first of all, that we're run by a board. And like I said, we're all volunteer-based. But the board... Um, through email, since uh, they were already doing uh, mandated social distancing. Uh, we started emailing back and forth, having phone calls, whatever, to say, what do we want to do? Do we want to still try and have a regular season and set up and all of those things? And the board decided that, yes, we do, that the produce doesn't wait, that um, a lot of these people rely on a little bit of income that they get from being a vendor at the market, that we should do our best to open on time which for us was last Saturday, April the 25th. And so we formulated a plan. And part of that was uh, taking part in, in the last panel that was put on by extension, which was really beneficial to look through those resources that were sent out to communicate that with the board and say, you know, what of this do we think that we can do? And so we put together a plan and I uh, put together an email just outlining all the steps that we were going to take to ensure that customers and vendors were safe. And so we communicated that plan to uh, several of our local partners, and then we immediately got feedback from them. And so we had to make adjustments on the plan. And then we had to communicate that plan to the vendors and to the customers, which all of this is, is pretty new and different from how uh, we normally do things and our partnerships have been really important in being able to open successfully on time. First of all, extension has uh, been great. The emails that have come out and even the PDFs and things that, that really help kind of give some weight to the things that we're saying um, so that the people in the community don't just think that we're making it up so that we can open when really we shouldn't, but to say, here's something from the state showing what I'm saying. The health department uh, having communicated, uh, with one of the ladies over at the health department that she was very clear in what she would allow and not allow for us to be able to open. We communicate with the city of Nixa and then the chamber of commerce. Uh, our market is a member of our, our local chamber and they have been huge for us and really gone to bat for us to be able to open. And then just a, a small shout out to a local company um, that was able to get us some things that we needed. Uh, Nixa hardware and seed provided some things so that we would be able to open. And those, all those import, uh, partnerships are just really important for us being able to open. When I emailed the health department, then they uh, sent me this list of rules that they wanted us to have in place uh, in order to be open. And some of these are easy enough to do. Um, and then some of them were actually uh, difficult when, when you don't think of it. And they change kind of the DNA of the market. Uh, we have a vendor that for instance, they, uh, they fresh roast coffee and then they sell the coffee at the market. Well, when they brew up coffee and it, you can smell that coffee, that's part of the experience and it drives their sales. So the first line there, no samples of any kind, uh, that was difficult for them to accept. Um, 
course they want to be able to sell their products so they're going to um, face masks were not that difficult but there were no gloves and no hand sanitizer anywhere to be found and so uh, if you look down in here all of the vendors had to have a sanitizer bottle on their table and so that's where the the local hardware store came in and provided those things to us for the vendors i'm not going to read through all of these but you can kind of take a look and see that there was quite a list and quite a few changes there for us from the health department and the city also requested that we do a drive-through style market uh, being close to springfield of course they've seen um, some of the advertisements online and different things for uh, farmers market of the Ozarks who is doing a, a drive-through market and even though we're a drastically different market uh, than FMO like they kind of saw that and thought that was best and so i um, really trying to adjust to uh, turn us into a, a drive-through market was difficult and we had a good plan um, but then on Thursday they said okay we don't need to do that you can just set up as normal as long as there's more space than usual so uh, that kind of drops into what we're actually doing and how our operations have changed. Um, the uh, spring vendor meeting where we talked to the vendors, I had to do that online. I made a video explaining all the rules and things that were different this year and then created a group online that I could go live on Facebook and answer questions. And we've had to communicate a lot more. Usually we just tell the chain, we're, hey, we're gonna open up, this will be our first Saturday, the same with the health department but we've had to increase those communications, uh, with lots of emails and calls and texts and different things like that to make sure that everybody's on the same page. We've had to spread out in our parking lot. So we're providing a whole parking space between each vendor. We also had to define an entrance and an exit and have a marked flow of traffic for the market and advertise that we're practicing social distancing. And something that's actually been very difficult is encouraging people to leave uh, because a lot of people come out and they want to visit for 20 or 30 minutes and the health department was asking us to ask them to go home after they make their purchase to be in and out as soon as possible. And then the Facebook communication is a little more uh, difficult because it's a lot of words trying to communicate all of the uh, things that the health department wants us to do, all the things that we're trying to do and to uh, present those in a positive way where uh, people understand, but long wordy posts, they get skipped over. And so that communication, I like short, punchy, uh, semi-humorous things. And so the more informational people tend to pass over that. So that's been a little more difficult as well. And so one of the things that we did um, is this is our setup. This is from last Saturday. Of course it, it rained and we had like 20 mile an hour winds <laughs> the first hour, but hey, it wouldn't be market season if it didn't rain on you the first week. So um, one of the things that we did on the uh, far right and the far left of this picture, you can see the farmer's market sign with the arrow. That's to indicate the flow of traffic. And we didn't have a huge crowd because of the weather, but we actually did have quite a few people come out um, this last Saturday. And then the two signs in the middle advertise some of the ways that, that we've changed. And these uh, directly uh, pretty much just stole them from the last round table and uh, took a screenshot of those slides from the Columbia market. And then we took them to our printer to change the name and, and set it up to look, uh, to say the, the Nixa farmer's market. So that's something that's been very uh, helpful. And uh, those communicate, and I noticed a lot of people uh, at the market that they, as they approached, uh, then usually that area is just wide open. There's not signs, there's not anything there communicating anything. It's just welcome to the, the thoroughfare of vendors. And so they did take the time to look at these and to understand. And the big one, I think for us was the choose with your eyes to try and keep people's hands off of the produce, off of the products so that we can provide a, a safe product uh, for the shoppers. And I think for us, the keys to being able to successfully open on time is patience. I don't know how many times uh, I was told one thing to the next day have it changed to something else. And that's okay because this is a evolving situation. And even as we go forward with a lot of communities looking to reopen over the next uh, few days and weeks, um, there are gonna be changes again. And so being patient in what's being asked of us is important and that goes hand in hand with flexibility and being able to kind of uh, float downstream. You know, I like to get out on the rivers in Missouri and float the river and a float trip is a lot easier when you go the same direction as the water and you want to steer that boat. You want to do what you can uh, while you're going in the direction of the events that are happening around us. And then 
honestly, you need to expect extra work. So uh, if you're used to the way things always are, they're going to change. And it may not be exactly like ours, but there are going to be changes and they may require extra work for you to be, to be open. And so, you know, one of the first things that we did as a board was what's the motivation? So do we even want to open the market? And that was a big question. And for us, uh, the answer was yes, because of three important points. And the first is that, you know, we get to support the local economy. In Nixa, these are all uh, local vendors, their grandmothers, their uh, neighbors just down the road that are growing produce or they have eggs or chickens, uh, you know, all the products that you can have. And so when that money gets spent, then that's staying here locally. And there's not a lot of money moving around the economy right now. So it's really important that even those few dollars stay at home. And so we decided that, that was really important. And then we feel like at the market that we can provide a safer, uh, higher quality of food than uh, at the big box stores. Nothing against the big box stores. I like getting a peach in January, but uh, how many people put that peach up to their face and smelled it and maybe it touched their nose. You know, our, our farmers, they pick it Friday night, Saturday morning, it's on the table Saturday morning. Not many people touch that food, if anybody, outside of the farmer. And so we all are small businesses and we can't afford to make somebody sick. So we are taking every precaution that we possibly can to put the safest, freshest food on the table. And so that means that not very many people have handled it, that it's safer food for uh, the customers that come to our farmer's market. And a lot of our customers are elderly folks. They would be folks that are considered at risk in this uh, pandemic. And a lot of our, our, our vendors take the um, senior market nutrition program, um, the checks that come out with that where the, the low income seniors can come and get fresh produce at the market. And those are, over the years, those people become our friends. We're happy to see them every year and we get to know them by name. And so we wanna provide them with the safest food possible. And then a big thing for me is that <clears throat> opening the market, it spreads hope. Uh, you know, anybody that's growing or making something, you know, they, they start with an idea. It's a spark of a couple of neurons in their brain that I'm going to grow this or I'm going to make this. And you follow through and you put in the effort and all of that is based in hope. I'm going to do these things in hope that this thing that I've thought of, this thing that I want to grow is going to provide joy to somebody else. It's going to help feed their body. It's going to be something that will be a great gift for their parent or their grandparent that all of these things are part of spreading hope in a time when there's not a lot of hope in the world. It seems like if you get consumed with the, the news or the Facebook feed or anything, then it can really bring you down. But we want to be a place that is really good for the community to be open because they see us and it helps to spread hope to know that things are going to get back to a normal. It, it may not be the same normal that we had before. We may have to wear masks all year. I don't know, but that stuff is still going to be there. That good, fresh, local produce, good, local quality products that are meaningful to both the seller and the buyer are going to be there. And that's really great for building up the community. And so we decided those three things were really important. Andrew, we need to wrap it up. Sorry. Okay. That's my last slide. So that's just in time. And uh, so that's, uh, that, that's what we wanted to do. And uh and oh, now you got to see me again. Sorry about that. So uh, the uh, that's that's what we've been doing, just trying to address everything. And um, so I'll just leave it right there. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, next, let me check here. We have, I just want to put my slide here. Our next presenter is Elisa um, uh, Bed Bedsworth, and she is from the Ivanhoe Farmers Market in the Kansas City area. Um, so, Elisa, if you want to start, and I'm not sure if you're gonna if you had a sl slide that you wanted to share, if you can remind us. Um, I do not have a slide I want to share. Okay, thank you, Elisa. That's now fine. I'm just trying to get the screen back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know. We'll just leave it. Okay, my name is Elisa Bedsworth, and I'm the Ivanhoe Farmers Market Manager. And um, the Ivanhoe Farmers Market is a little bit different than other far farmers market uh, in the area. 
Um, the Ivanhoe Farmers Market is um, part of a 5013C, which is the Ivanhoe Neighborhood Council. And the Ivanhoe Farmers Market is in its 10th year. I've been the market manager. This is my fourth year. And um, it was started by a group of residents um, through the Ivanhoe um, Health Initiatives to um, uh, they had a community garden and they had so much produce and they didn't know what to do with it. So they said, hey, let's start a farmer's market. So when I started four years ago, there were about five or six vendors and it was held in a little parking lot that was running downhill and it was on a Friday night. So um, after my first year, we changed it. We moved up to the LAMP campus, and uh, which is at Linwood and Woodland in Kansas City. And um, a little background on Ivanhoe. Ivanhoe neighborhood is about 6,300 people. It's 98% African-American. Um, about 60%, I would say, are seniors and elderly. So um, most of our patrons at our market are, are older people. I would say they're mostly uh, 55 years of age and older. We do have a few families and single individuals, but most of our uh, patrons are older. And um, so anyway, with this, so actually my position as a market manager is seasonal, so it was usually from uh, around April to the end of September when the market ended. But this year they brought me back in February so that I could be the um, uh, help with the senior program. So right now I was helping with as the senior program manager, helping with the Ivan, they're called the Ivanhoe Villagers. They're from people from 55 years of age and older. And so I was, you know, hanging out with them and doing things with them and we we're going on field trips. And then uh, COVID-19 and March 15th and we all got quarantined. And so what do you do? So um, I started reaching out to them and calling, I call my villagers um, on a weekly basis. We started reaching out to them, making sure that they were okay, making sure they had food, making sure they had essentials. And so as my supervisor, Neil Rudisil and I were talking about what are we gonna do with the market? Can we open, can we not open? Well, our, our market, Neil's and my offices are up the LAMP campus and um, the, LAMP campus and the Harold Thomas Center that's on the LAMP campus is home to multiple 501c3s and one of them is a drug and alcohol rehab and we also have um, the Front Porch Alliance which works with uh, low-income families and infants and children and so we have a lot of um, really uh, you know people with um, suppressed immune systems on that property so the uh, the LAMP campus is owned by the Heartland Presbytery and they decided that no, we were not going to open the farmer's market this year. And we, we have no choice and we can't change that. So we um, decided what are we gonna do and what are we gonna focus on and um, how can we uh, better our community and, and keep the farmer's market going and, and reach out to our, our people. So our focus areas are gonna be um, our seniors and we actually are going to instead of having a farmers market this year we are going to have um, a CSA so we are going to focus on um, having our farmers bring produce in that we package up um, and and people drive through and pick up their CSA and then at another table and there will only be three tables set up and um, so the first is the CSA pickup that they will pick up that they pay for weekly. And then we will have a point of sale. We do have people that sell um, jams and jelly and honey. We have Cali seasoning. Um, I would say 98% of our vendors are produce vendors. We are a produce only um, market. So our vendors have to grow what they sell. And, um, and then we have some like Cali seasoning that's a seasoning, they have their own seasonings. Um, we have a kombucha, artisan kombucha. So we have, uh, we don't have any craft vendors at our market. And um, so it'll, it'll be really good to have the CSA for the, for the vendors. So our focus is gonna be on our seniors. And so the first CSA, um, we're partnering with um, Mark and Camby's Markets and um, the age, uh, Agency for Aging to produce um, uh, like I've been going out and signing people up for the last few weeks for this senior uh, frozen meal plan where they get 10 frozen meals, they get 10 portions of veg uh, fruits, not vegetables, fruits, 
10 half pints of milk and a loaf of bread every two weeks delivered. So we're reaching out to our community, to our seniors. Um, last year, I had reached out to these same communities and was able to get people signed up for the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program so that they could come to the farmers market and spend their Senior Farmers Market vouchers at the farmers market. So we reached out to those people with that. Um, we're also um, networking with some of the food pantries to make sure people are signed up and they're getting their commodity boxes. And um, most of these uh, things and that we're helping to get them or some of them are actually needs like toiletries and uh, just trying to fill in the gaps for these people. But we are planning on doing um, a senior, it's like a senior CSA so that they can have fresh locally grown produce and the produce uh, that will go into those boxes will be partially from um, our vendor, our farmer vendors at the Ivanhoe Farmers Market to complete those boxes and make sure that they have what they need during this time. And um, our second group of people that we're trying to reach is just our customer base and reach out to them and make sure that, um, you know, by Facebook and social media, just contacting them saying, you know, we cannot operate like we always have, but here's an option. You can be part of the CSA this year. Um, there will be things that are offered um, at point of sales. Uh, we will be doing SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks um, at the market with the CSA. So our, our SNAP um, individuals can participate in the CSA. And, um, and then our second group that we're, our third group we're focusing on are vendors. And we've always been a little bit different. I'm like, I like to say that, but we actually train our vendors. We, you know, what do you need? And then we'll do a workshop on it. So we, they wanted, they, we talked about high tunnels and growing four seasons. So we did four season growing workshops and we held high tunnel workshops and we saw 45 high tunnels come out of the NRC as high uh, equip high tunnel grant over the two years that we did three of those workshops. And so our education for our vendors is really important in helping them. And so we have turned to them and said, what do you need from us during this time? And so we have encouraged them to all start online stores to sell from their farm, to have a farm stand. Um, I know several of them looked, uh, took the workshop yesterday, uh, Tuesday from 11 to 12 through the MU extension about how to take SNAP um, on your farm, in your farmstead, because we want them to have multiple streams of income. So this year they're going to have um, the streams of income from their farm stand. They're going to have streams of income from the CSA that we're helping to provide for. The frozen meals, they're actually going to be pr uh, purchasing produce to produce those meals from our vendors or and um, and then this and um, did I get the right the sorry uh, the the CSA the farmers market CSA selling from their property and also working with Canby's markets with the frozen meals and also with the fresh produce going into the boxes for the senior CSA so those are the means of income that we are really encouraging our seniors and um, a really um, part of the Ivanhoe um, Healthcare Initiatives is community engagement. And we are in the process of um, getting our certified kitchen, which is about 30 feet from the farmer's market uh, going. And we also have, um, today they were just laying out, um, we have a 38 raised bed uh, community garden that's right about 30 feet <laughs> north of the farmer's market. So we have um, a lot of growing area for now, and we are going to be putting together some videos, some cooking videos, for the seniors, um, we kind of have uh, a three-part thing that we were working on. Um, the first part was the senior frozen meals, and then the second part was the commodity boxes. And now our third part that we're working on is working with a company called, a nonprofit called Connecting for Good, and connecting our seniors and making sure that they have computer access in their home, making sure they have a hotspot and a computer so that we can, um, so they can watch cooking videos um, on YouTube so that they can have um, Zoom meetings so we can FaceTime with them and check in on them and make sure that they're doing okay. And so um, I'm just encouraging everybody, this is just a really weird time and um, we're here for you and we're here to help uh, get you what you need and provide for you um, and just, just to surround our community and um, to make sure that, uh, that they know that they're not alone in this and that, that we're here to help provide uh, food for them. And I guess that's um, basically what we're doing here. You know, that's. Thank you, Elisa. We, we appreciate. It's very, really admirable what you all been doing with the senior citizens there.
Um, our next presenter, we'll probably have questions for everybody uh, once we're done, but our next presenter is uh, Jamie Gando, and he's with the Oregon County Farmers Market. And uh, Jamie, are you having slides to share or are you uh, just- No, I don't have any slides. Okay, so I'm just gonna let you go then. And well, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. So I'm Jamie Gundel. I'm actually an agronomy specialist with MU Extension based in Oregon County. And I am also the president of the Oregon County Farmers Market. Uh, our market started back in 2018. We started about mid-year that year. Uh, we have a growing Amish community in the, in the county. And then we have several people uh, who raise produce, several of our current vendors who were actually traveling to neighboring counties to sell their produce. So we saw a need there, uh, brought some of those people that had experience with farmers markets in. We started having some discussions, got our market put together and got started. And our market's done really well. Uh, for just being around, this would be this is would have been the start of our second full season. Uh, last year, we had a total of 26 vendors that had signed up at one point or another. Um, on average, we usually have 8, 10, maybe 12 or 15 um, just throughout the season. And our customers um, usually will average somewhere in the 50 to 75 range. We may have days that we get up closer to 100. And our plan was to open last Saturday, April 25th. Uh, with everything going on, our board, we had a discussion um, and we have a few elderly vendors and a lot of elderly customers and we decided for the safety of our vendors and our customers both uh, that we would be best to postpone our opening uh, until later date and we haven't set that date yet we kind of want to wait and see how everything works um, so we basically left it up to the vendors how they wanted to try and sell their products or continue to do business and several of them have done very well with it uh, we have a lot of vendors that, you know, don't come on till later in the season anyways. We usually have, a, you know, fewer vendors actually at the market early on in the season to start with. Um, but we do have one vendor who is actually doing deliveries. Um, people can purchase products from them and they deliver it to their doorstep. It's zero contact. It's, you know, paid for before they ever get there. Uh, and then we have a couple other vendors that are doing some, some private on-farm sales. Uh, the um, customers can come out, come to their farm, kind of see what products they have. And that way uh, the vendors can actually set the protocol for how they want to do that. So, uh, you know, some of them are saying, okay, you know, making them sanitize their hands before they come in to look at anything. Or some of them are saying, you know, okay, you know, stay outside. Here's the products that I have. What are you interested in? They bring it to them. Um, but that way it, it, it kind of, I mean, it was just a safety concern for us was the biggest issue. Uh, it was a tough decision for us not to open the market. We were really pretty excited about this season. We've had a lot of good things happening. Like I said, we really grew a lot last season. Um, we actually have just sent off, we just recently incorporated and we sent off our 501c3 application. We're actually waiting to hear back on that. Uh, we expanded our board this past season. We added some new board members just to get some fresh ideas in. And we've got a pretty good mix of vendors and non-vendors on our board. So we kind of get different perspective. We get a perspective of some, some of the vendors and what they might like to see, and then maybe some customers, and then some people that are just kind of neutral. So that works out really well. Um, and we are very blessed that even though we're in a rural community and very low population, the population of our entire county is only around 11,000. And we have a really good diversity and quite a few vendors. Um, obviously we have produce vendors and we have several of those. We have a certified organic producer um, that raises produce and also raises certified organic beef and that they sell at the market. Um, we have producers that do jams and jellies, producers that do honey, uh, have vendors that um, sell other types of meat. We have one that sells processed chickens. And then we have some, some craft vendors also. Uh, we have a vendor that makes handmade soaps. Uh, we have a vendor that makes uh, lawn furniture. And we do have a blacksmith that came a couple of times last season. They actually brought their forge out there and kind of did demonstrations and then had some of the things that they've, that they've made in the past. And we were able to kind of separate them. Uh, so 
our market, we're in Alton, Missouri, which is in Oregon County, South Central Missouri, right on the Arkansas line. And we partnered with uh, Alton City Council uh, whenever we first got interested in this, looking for a location. And there's a city park. It's a really nice setting. There's kind of a little creek that runs by, and there's kind of a walking trail around. And they let us use that at no cost. Um, there's trees for shade, although sometimes there's not quite enough shade for everybody. But we were able to set up down there. And people can just kind of come and go as they please. It's worked out really well for us. And we have plenty of space if we do need to spread out. Um, similar to some of the other markets uh, and kind of what Andrew was saying. So we are a, you know, have to grow it or produce it yourself market. Uh, we don't allow any products to be, you know, purchased somewhere else and resold. And all of our vendors are from Oregon County or a surrounding county. Uh, I don't believe we've actually had any vendors come up from Arkansas yet, but we do join a couple of counties in Arkansas and we have, you know, tried to put the word out there that they would be allowed also. And um, we do work really closely with our local health department. Um, we've tried to work with them. It's been a learning process for all of us also, um, trying to figure out all the regulations and the food safety laws and our health department, our health inspector has been great to help us navigate through all that and get that information out to our vendors just to make sure that we're in compliance and doing everything right. Um, we have also worked with our, um, our local chamber of commerce and they've helped promote the market. Uh, there's a big festival that is done in Alton every year. I think this past year was their 34th year for it and the Chamber of Commerce um, puts that on. They actually allowed the farmer's market to come in and set up and didn't, didn't cost them anything. So the vendors that had paid, um, we didn't have a lot of vendors there, but that was in October. So kind of getting to the tail end of the season, a lot of produce had already come out. Uh, some of the, some of our farmer's market vendors had already planned to be vendors at that festival and had already paid for booth space. So they just decided to take their own booth space. Um, but we've, we've had some really good partnerships as really helped get our name out there, really helped our market grow. And we're hoping if we get our 501c3 uh, status approved, uh, we do have our eye on some grants that we would like to apply for. One idea that we have, uh, there's some grants available and we've got some, some educators that have already said they'd be willing to help us out with this. Uh, but we would like to establish a small orchard. Uh, the city council is on board for us doing that at that park location. And then we can use that orchard for both education purposes and then what it produces would be donated to probably the senior centers in the county uh, so that we could help out some senior citizens. Uh, I know the, uh, the senior farmer's market nutrition program was mentioned earlier. Uh, we do have some vendors that accept those. Last year was our first year doing that. We have some that are going to continue and a few new vendors going to accept those this year. Um, we have not, uh, we're not equipped to take any SNAP benefits or EBT or anything like that yet. Uh, that is something that we're kind of looking into. Um, I wasn't able to sit in on that session the other day, but I believe some of our other board members did. And that is something that we were going to discuss is if we could get set up to do that. And uh, something else that we try and do a lot of at our market is some type of activity. Uh, so we're fortunate, you know, myself working for Extension, one of our other board members uh, is actually our office secretary for the Extension office. And then uh, we have a youth program associate that runs 4-H for Oregon County also in our office. So our secretary and our YPA, uh, they worked together last season and they had different craft days. Um, at the market. So they would set up at the farmer's market and any kids that came through, you know, whatever craft they were doing that day, I think they did bird feeders. They did, uh, I don't know what the technical name is, but they did kind of some uh, almost wind chimes, uh, but they were more decorative uh, and just did some different things. I had a lot of fun with that and we saw a lot of interest. And then we also have a nutrition program associate that's in the neighboring county and she has come over multiple times. You know, our market's on Saturday. She comes over, sets up a table. She'll give out recipes and she'll do some, some education on the nutrition of produce and different ways that people might be able to use it. Uh, sometimes she might give out samples of different recipes and stuff. So 
we've uh, we've got a lot of different things going on for being a smaller market and being in a really rural area. We're really proud of that. Uh, we were really looking forward to this season because we've just kind of hit the ground running and we were hoping to just kind of keep moving with everything. But we just decided for the, the safety of our vendors and our customers, it was going to be best to postpone our opener. Um, you know, we just, we've had to miss last weekend and we're going to miss this weekend. I think we're going to start talking next week about possibly opening the week after. Uh, but we're keeping safety our, our priority for now and hoping that we don't have to miss too many Saturdays before we can get open back up. Uh, we know, I mean, we ourselves and then all of our customers, all of our vendors, we really enjoy the interactions at the farmer's market. Uh, and I know Andrew talked about, you know, that was one of the things the health department requested was that they tell people that, you know, hey, once you get your stuff, just move on, go on home. Um, that's kind of tough for us because we really enjoy those interactions and those conversations and stuff. And uh, I know personally, whenever I visit the market, you know, it doesn't take me very long to go through and shop for what I'm looking for. Uh, but I'm usually there for, you know, an hour or two just visiting with everybody and kind of catching up, especially with people that we haven't seen in a while. And, and that's going to be, um, I think that's been kind of a big, a, a big draw for our community is to come in. They get to visit with people and see different things. And a lot of our vendors are very good about educating the customers from, you know, on how their produce is grown, and where it comes from. And those interactions have been very b beneficial, I believe, in in getting our our market out there, you know, getting us some better publicity and helping expand our market. So we're hoping to get back to that. Um, and, you know, listening to some of the, the other speakers today, uh, hearing some good ideas and maybe some things that we might look into trying to do in the future, um, you know, even after all the regulations and stuff, maybe even after the, the safety issues aside, I've heard some things that, that sound like they could be good and be beneficial in the future just to, to keep safety in front for everybody. So. Um, that's all I have and be here to take any questions if anybody has. Thank you, Jamie. We will have all the Q&A at the end once uh, our last panelist is done. Um, so our next uh, presenter is Martha Clark and she is from the Southside Junction Farmers Market in the Northwest Missouri. So Martha, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, great. And do you have anything you want to share? No, um, I have no pictures. I have nothing like that. Um, okay, great. A lot, of, a lot of what I have is a lot of what's already been said. I, you know, when Andrew was talking, I was thinking, you know, that's very much like our market. Um, you know, there may be a few differences. One in particular, I, my name is Martha Clark. I was supposed to introduce myself and I, I forgot. Anyway, um, I am the project manager for the SAS St. Joe Development Corporation, and that is a, a nonprofit corporation that was established by some uh, business owners and residents in the South St. Joe area uh, to oversee the revitalization of a, an area that had declined over the years. Um, it's located close to the uh, stockyards and the when the packing houses kind of closed, why a lot of that area went downhill. So um, it it had been overlooked for quite some time, uh, and so they said, "Well, would you would you come and help make this happen?" So they developed a, a revitalization plan, and one of the components of it was a farmers market. Uh, the people were were concerned because. The closest uh, grocery store that they had was at least five miles away from this particular area that, that we're working in. So I said, okay, now to be quite honest, I had only gone to one farmer's market in my life. So it was really quite the learning curve. And, um, and interesting that this situation is an even bigger learning curve, but uh, we did get the market open. Uh, this this will be our sixth season. Um, the first year we had three vendors. We had rain for about the first six Saturdays, and it was it was really quite a difficult time. But we had such dedicated vendors and and dedicated customers, so we just we kept it up. Um, we 
had, we thought we were doing good if we had 30 customers during that three hours. And uh, it's grown every year now. We've added some. We've actually, our numbers last year, we had at least 17 over the, over the whole time period. And we were having 100 customers every Saturday morning in that three hour period. So we were open from eight to 12 every Saturday morning once we open. Our original plan this year was to open on the 2nd of May, but it, it just was something that was not feasible because everything kind of hit and, and we had to adjust to that. And not knowing whether or not we would be able to open at all, uh, when I got the word that we were considered essential, I thought, well, you know, we can do this. So been working toward it now for a while we will open on the 16th of may so um looking forward to it have been in contact with the vendors and they are anxious to get started um my vendors are just like a lot of these other ones they you know they want people to come for the experience and not just coming into uh, you know, buy and pull in, buy your stuff and leave. And that's what's going to be a really hard part for us as well, because, you know, the vendors are so good to explain things to people and, and interact with them. So, you know, it, it's going to be a tough time. Um, I have tried to get the vendors to organize as a, a nonprofit, a 501c3. And they kind of like it the way it is. And I, I keep telling them that, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. You all need to take this over and do it yourselves. And so, um, you know, that's, that's always kind of the interesting part of it because I would help them get set up and I wouldn't just go off and leave them. They don't know that. So they don't trust me, I guess. Anyway, um, I have been encouraging the, the vendors to you know take pre-orders and be ready to have people come we will have a, a pickup location where they can they can come in and pick up the whatever they have ordered and we you know the parking lot we're on is is city owned and it has no utilities um but I figured a way to be able to take the uh, staff and credit cards. So that's been working out real well for us. We do have, um, we have some, a couple of businesses that are right across from our parking lot that allow us to use their facilities if we need to. But, um, you know, we, we bring the hand washing station every week anyway. So, one of the things that we're going to do in order to meet the requirements is to add a second hand washing station and have the hand sanitizer and all those things that you all know that that we have to do uh, lots of signs uh, encouraging the um, you know the the six foot social divisions and and uh, I think you know my my market people they don't, you know, they have no pavilion. The parking lot is only big enough for like 42 vehicles. So we're going to have to, you know, space out a little bit different. Um, I, you know, I've been working on the plan for that. Um, we're, we're going to ask that people, if not use their, their canvas green bags, we're kind of, not real thrilled about the single use plastics, but anyway, um, if someone comes and wants to use their own bag, we will ask that they that they fill it themselves. Um, asking people to shop with their eyes and not with their fingers and let the vendors serve them. And I think that's, you know, that's gonna be a good thing for them. Um, St. Joe is, has a population of about 76,000 people and there is one other farmers market that is located more toward the the uh, northern northeast section of the town right off the highway so in a big shopping mall parking lot um, 
it's quite a bit different from ours, uh, but we have people that drive right by that one and come to ours because they like the the experience and and the quality of the things that they get and the price that they that they pay. Um, our vendors will have face masks and rubber gloves and everything that the health department has requested for us in order to allow us to open. So um, the one thing that I have yet to get uh, worked out is uh, the cards and keeping them sanitized between the use. So um, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I, I was really glad that I sat in on the first panel that talked about all the things that the, the larger markets were doing, and in particular Columbia, um, you know, they were they were already open and operating, and they had to really think fast and make things happen fast because that's a a nice size market. So, um, I guess maybe some of the things that that we're going to miss. You know, we generally try to have some events, um, you know, at least two of them a, a month. Um, we have a, a library that's in the area that the librarian would come and, and give away books to the youngsters. Um, she would read to them. Um, that's something that we're not going to be able to do now. But, you know, it this too shall pass and, and we'll all get through it. Um, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to getting back with the people and, and, you know, having good things happen again. So I think with that, everybody else has pretty much touched on everything. So um, I'd be glad to give my time to have questions and answers. Thank you, Martha. I appreciate that. Um, so I just want to wrap up a couple of points and then we're going to open up for questions and answers but as you have seen the four markets have um, different strategies uh, Andrew and Martha both mentioned that they will be open uh, but Elisa's uh, situation is they can kind of shift it into focusing more on uh, serving the senior citizens that they actually have in that area and who they have been serving already but it has forced them to use a different community engagement uh, kind of uh, tools, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I think nobody can argue that uh, farmers markets are more than just food. And so uh, it is a big challenge to not uh, to have to go there fast and pick up your stuff and buy online and not have that personal aspect that's so important. Everybody pretty much agrees on that. Um, and then also Jamie's uh, situation is very different. They went to uh, direct sales. So, uh, so far they're not planning to open. So they changed the structure of how they're, uh, they're going to operate or how they're operating. Um, and things that are kind of important that some of you mentioned also, how the local relationships that also appeared in the first panel are so important. Uh, the local health department is one that has, uh, was mentioned. And also Andrew mentioned uh, the, the, the local business that, how, that helped them find the gloves and the sanitizers. And that has been a challenge for me personally also to get my sanitizers or alcohol or whatever. Um, marketing is a challenge as well. We, uh, social media, of course, has exploded in the past couple of um, weeks and not just for farmers markets. And so it's a challenge to post uh, very short, concise information that people are not just going to they're just gonna actually see it because if you post too long, people are not gonna open it because there is more traffic there. You're right about that, and that's a challenge for everybody. Um, so that's, and it does take time to post short. That's the other thing. Um, Jamie also mentioned uh, a point about that relates to organization, organi organizational structure. Uh, your board members are not just vendors, but you have outside um, ven outside uh, board members, which is something that I have seen with cooperatives that has worked very nicely. Um, it helps to have that, those voices that give you an outside perspective. Um, and then challenges like having no utilities. Well, then if you don't have a utility in a parking lot where you're selling, how are you going to uh, uh, make your payments work? Something that Martha mentioned. Um, and then doing more than just the food, uh, again from uh, Elisa, 
that she even mentioned things like they, they're helping the seniors get hotspots and having that access to the internet. And that is a challenge in Missouri. We have over a million people without broadband access in the state. And this is not just a rural problem, it's also an urban problem. University of Missouri has been very active on this recently um, because uh, that actually hinders our economic growth. And this definitely shows up in the farmer's market situation right now, particularly when you're facing uh, uh, this kind of, um, uh, kind of crisis. So with that, uh, I want to see if people have questions. Um, you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question, or if you want to post it in the chat. Let me see the chat here. Pam, do you or any of the co-hosts, do you want to check the chat? Because if I'm sharing my screen, it hides it. There's a question from Mark Goodwin. How have you been able to communicate with vendors? who only have, have a landline phone or snail mail or both? Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let the panelists answer that, go ahead. This, this is Jamie, I'll jump in on that. So uh, we do both. Uh, a lot of times whenever we have to contact our vendors for anything, we usually try and do it by letter. Um, we did just to make sure that we, you know, got feedback from the vendors whenever we decided not to open. We did do it by phone just to make sure that they were receiving that message. Uh, and I mentioned that we do have a, a growing Amish community. Obviously, they don't have phone. And so to make sure that they were getting that information, I just personally went out and visited with them, um, you know, just let them know what was going on. So uh, we'll, we'll contact them any way that we need to. Uh, like I say, we, we prefer to do things by mail. We do some on social media. We do have a Facebook page for the market. Uh, but again, just to ensure that we reach everybody, a lot of times we'd like to rely on phone or in-person contact. I might, I might just say that I, we have um, a big presence on Facebook. Um, we have our, our market page and we have over a thousand people who pay attention to that and the the uh, vendors will interact with me on on the uh, message chat so it works well for us the majority of our vendors um, communicate via email um, but if we did run into somebody, sometimes we do people have people at the market that just come up and want to know about joining the market, um, then we can talk to them in person. So uh, not, it hasn't really been an issue for us uh, at this point, but we would do whatever it took obviously to communicate with them. We, I did set up a, a group chat in uh, Facebook. And so the, uh, I get uh, kind of pinged real time all through the week on that, but um, yeah. Elisa, do you have anything to add to that question? Two vendors that grow maybe 20 miles away, but everybody else is just right here. You know, if somehow they're not answering their emails or text messages or phone calls, I just run over to their farm and talk to them. Maria, this is a this is Bill, and I have a question. Um, well, actually, there's one that just came in the chat, so let's take that one first. Um, from Doris, how do you plan to handle customers who refuse? or choose not to social distance? Very good question, Doris. Any of our panelists want to take that one on? Uh, I don't know that I want to take that one on. <laughs> uh, I, I think that would be a difficult situation. And I think um, part, of, part of the... Uh, I don't know how to say it exactly, but you know, there's a lot of opinions out there about what's true and what's not true. And uh, of course we, we do have a, a 
diversely minded community. Um, and so uh, it, it's, uh, I, I, I guess if it was a concern, I don't think most of our vendors care. They uh, aren't that concerned um, for the most part and they're in, in gloves and masks and things like that. And then this Saturday, you know, a lot of our customers, probably 60% of them that came out on Saturday were also wearing masks. And so I think the people that are, um, you know, really concerned with it are already wearing masks themselves. Um, but that's uh, part of, I, I didn't actually set up to sell any of my goods this week so that I could just tell people, hey, one person at a table per time, and that's uh, something that we tried to communicate through Facebook as well, that just one customer at the table at a time and uh, just kind of hoped. So I don't no, I'm bad about that kind of thing. Uh, you know, I was at the grocery store yesterday and the lady that was bagging up my groceries had a runny nose and was literally wiping her hand on her nose as she bagged my groceries. And <laughs> I didn't say anything then, except I thought a lot of things. Um, so I don't, I don't know. That's not a good answer, uh, but it's all, the only answer I got. <laughs> um, I'll just put a little little spot in here. So since we have decided to postpone our opening, we're hoping that a lot of those, you know, restrictions and advisements will be lifted by the time that we do open. Uh, but as far as you know, handling customers just in general, because we do have some some rules for our market for both the vendors and the customers. Uh, you know, we have things about like having live animals and stuff, as long as, you know, if they're not a service animal and that type of stuff. Um, and, you know, basically our approach to that, you know, be courteous, you know, ask them nicely to do it. Uh, so our market, uh, we're, we were actually planning to make a little bit of a change this year. So uh, we have a board that makes all the decisions for the market. And then we have a market manager that just kind of runs the market, at, you know, during, during the market hours. And um, the way that had been last year, we had, you know, one market manager. She was also a vendor. She did a great job, but it was a lot to ask of somebody to be there every Saturday to set up and sell for their business and then also be in charge of everything else that's going on at the market. So what we were going to do this year is we were actually going to rotate through our board members and, you know, have have a different market manager or, you know, somebody may have to do a couple Saturdays in a row or something like that, but kind of spread that duty out. So it wasn't just such a, such a burden on that one vendor and board member. Uh, and, you know, kind of our, our approach that we've discussed for how to handle things like that is, you know, ask them nicely if they refuse, you know, we'll have the market manager step in and do what we need to do. Can I say something? Um, I saw advertise or uh, in a, I think it was a farmer's market from Connecticut and I thought it was really wise, but they had taken and they had, um, I think it was sidewalk chalk, but I, I think I'll probably paint ours, but they had painted circles like right in front of the, the tents that people were purchasing from. And they had actually a strung a string across the front of the, the canopy so that they couldn't reach across that. And they had a little sign note that said, please don't don't touch and on the circle it said purchaser and then there was a circle about six feet behind them off to the side and it said on deck and I thought that was really wise to you know kind of give you know give them a feel of where is six feet how far away to be and then the thing is is you know if they're just kind of walking around and not kind of following those those circles or that direction then you know just saying you know, would you please, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to abide by the health department rules. We're trying to do what's safe for everyone. You know, not everyone agrees, but you know, in order for us to remain open, would you just please follow these guidelines? And, you know, I have a, a relationship um, with everybody that comes into the farmer's market. You know, I greet everybody that comes into the farmer's market. You know, I talk to them, how's your day going? How's your week been? Um, are you looking for anything special? So everybody that comes into the market, I really try to talk to. And so even if we were up running our full market, I don't think we would have, like, I don't think we would have that problem as much as other people have, because we have um, relationships through the Ivanhoe Neighborhood Council and all the other activities that we provide for the Ivanhoe Neighborhood. So um, I think that our citizens would be, um, and our neighbors would be, um, 
in would basically probably 98.5% be in compliance to what's going on. Martha, is there anything you would like to add? Uh, I guess it would be uh, in, in terms of what you expect once you open, perhaps. Well, uh, you know, in speaking about the, uh, about the last uh, few comments, we have a real good relationship with our police department. And generally there is, there is a drop by the market every Saturday morning. So, you know, just having that presence not that not that we have to have them there, um, but when we first when we first opened, we had an incident where there was someone sleeping in their vehicle on the parking lot, and the police were called to come and and wake them up because we didn't know. You know, we're there at six o'clock in the morning and ready to set up, but but we didn't know what to expect. And ever since that time you know, they have made it a point to stop by and, and visit every Saturday morning. So, you know, that I feel comfortable, even though, you know, I wouldn't expect anything like that happening with, with our customers that come because we all have good relationships. So, um, you know, that's as far as, you know, what to expect, when we open on the 16th, I'm, you know, I'm open. I know that there are going to have to be some changes. They're going to, you know, it's going to take a lot of, of watching what's going on, but, you know, we, we tend to share the, the responsibility of it and everybody's in it because they want to be there. Um, they would miss the, the relationships as much as, as, as we do so um you know i i'm just going to be flexible um i'm going to be welcoming i'm going to be encouraging and you know that's how we're going to make it happen thank you martha and i don't know bill if you want to go next but martha just mentioned again what um uh, Andrew mentioned when he presented the importance of patience, flexibility, and expect extra work. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's just what it takes. Yeah, I'll go ahead and ask my question. Um, so we've heard some reports from around the state and elsewhere of um, community members who have been uh, very concerned about the opening of farmers markets. Um, and so I'm wondering for our panelists, what has been the reaction uh, of the community or maybe the community hasn't really had a reaction and if there was any type of negative reaction, what have you done to um, kind of assure people that, you know, the farmer's market is a safe place to shop for food? Well, I'll take that. Um, you know, our presence on Facebook has been outstanding and our communication, uh, we did get a promotional grant from uh, the Department of Agriculture again. And so, you know, I've been trying to put information out on, at least on the Facebook page of you know how we are going to be or how things are going to have to be for all of us in order for us to be open and our our customers seem to be real excited that we're we're going to be open and I have not seen the negativeness at least in in the the community I actually I do not live within the city limits so I don't hear maybe if there is any negatives going on, I have not heard it, but it might be because of my location, uh, you know, being quarantined and, uh, you know, not being able to be in town that much. Uh, all I know is what I, you know, the emails I get and the encouragement to, to get the market open.
uh, for us, there was, um, a, it just comes back to partnerships, really. Uh, when we were first able, when the health department said, okay, if you can follow these guidelines, then you can open. Then I posted uh, a few days after that, that we were going to open and what our opening day would be. And not too long after that, I got a call from the guy at the chamber and some other businesses uh, in, in town that have not been able to open were uh, a little bit upset, <laughs> a little bit uh, jealous maybe. And so we had to go back and I ended up making a long post that talked about all of the steps that we were going to take, all the people that we had communicated with to ensure that we would have a, a safe market and just outlining uh, that since we provide a food and we provide a method for low-income seniors to get fresh produce that we were an essential business that that had a right to open and had a responsibility in a way to open and um, so this Saturday the, uh, everybody that I talked to was thrilled that we were open um, and there was some concern somebody came up at the, end of the other end of the parking lot and like had a camera and was taking pictures of the vendors and things. So I don't exactly know if that was somebody trying, that was gonna try and report us for being open. Uh, he never talked to us. We don't really know what that was about, but that was kind of, there has been a little bit of that um, around town. Uh, just kind of the idea that I'm gonna tell on people for not obeying and uh, all of that, but nothing major. And like I said, everybody that actually came up, they were thrilled. I mean, they, they uh, all of the vendors actually did really well for it being a rainy Saturday. Uh, everybody at, by the end of the day was honestly kind of shocked at how well they had done. And the people that, that, that came in, I mean, they, they were just thrilled that we were there, thrilled to get good quality products. And um, so I, I, I anticipate that being the case uh, just even more and more as, as things uh, start to open up. Uh, our, our mayor's stay-at-home order, they've decided, I think, uh, the fourth is the last day for it. So uh, a lot of the local restaurants and stuff even are going to start opening up. Um, so I imagine that we'll just see a lot of people really happy that we're open. Elisa, you said you had, I think you had something to add there. Um, well, we really haven't had, I mean, our our neighbors and people in the neighborhood are disappointed that the market's not opening up in its usual way, but they've been really understanding and, um, you know, we're hoping maybe, you know, we can ha start reopening in August and September as the farmer's market, um, but they're, they're excited about the CSA and uh, being able to get fresh produce. Do we have other questions anybody wants to bring up? If not, then we can close. I would like to ask you if you could uh, please respond to a short poll. It should be fast, hopefully, and um, as you exit. And we will be sending the um, link to the, um, to the video and then also the updated handout. I will include the old one also in case uh, some of you have not gotten the first one. And there is a um, extension article that has been written for this uh, event. And so I, we will post them there too. So you will get a copy of that link as well. Uh, hopefully by tomorrow, whenever we have the video ready. And with that, I wanna thank the panelists for their time. They did a great job uh, presenting their situation and also sharing some of the things they've been doing. And we greatly appreciate that. Um, some of them have mentioned that they did benefit from the first panel, so we hope that uh, some of you today were, uh, will be able to benefit from what they shared today. And uh, if you have any further comments, you're welcome to email me just by responding to the reminder I sent this morning. Thank you very much.